Welcome to Mac and Blue, where we introduce you to who is building Arizona, bringing you the people and businesses that shape the landscape around us. From economic development and developers, underwriters and lenders, architects and engineers, to the very builders and suppliers that bring it all together. For all things Mac and Blue, head to www.macandblue.com and don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Now let's join our host, JJ Levensky. Hi everyone, welcome to Mac and Blue. I'm JJ Levinsky, your host, uh, co-founder and president of Blue Wave General Contracting. Uh, today, uh, I know this may be a little bit tangential, but today I have an awesome guest, uh, Herman Plank, who's the co-founder and CIO, uh, Chief Innovation Officer of MedX Fashion. Now, before all of you leave, just hold tight because uh, I saw an article about Herman and his partner, Brandon. Brandon, Brandon, is that yep, right? Yep, Brandon. Brandon, a uh, couple, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, a month or so ago. And in PBJ, I was reading that and I'm like, okay, I got to have this guy on the on the podcast. Now, I think if you can just hang tight with us over the next hour, you'll understand why. And the why is, is because Herman and, and through all of his unbelievable stories that hopefully you'll hear about today, um, there's a synergy between what we're trying to do in the AEC space and what he's already been doing, kind of transforming the fashion industry and things in the metaverse and a bunch of things that, that we're going to get into. Now, for those of you that didn't know me when, when I first started podcasting, this was a, a big thing that I started doing probably about a, oh, a little over a year ago, talking about blockchain, NFTs, DAOs, uh, all the things that I felt should be um, construed and, and, and looked at upon our industry because I think we're a little bit behind the times. So I, I'm just getting a little bit tangential just to, 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 to kind of pave the path here. But before we get into all the, the meat of it, um, uh, Herman, we got to get to know you a little bit more. So uh, let the audience know a little bit about your past. Uh, when you hear his accent, you can tell he's not from uh, Thailand or Mexico. Uh, he's from Austria. So <laughs> uh, with that, Herman, if you could just welcome and, and tell us a little bit about your past. Thanks, JJ. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, my name is Herman Blank. Uh, I'm originally from Austria. My background, I have a master's degree in polymer science and engineering from a college in Austria. Uh, right out of college, uh, uh, one of the leading uh, plastics machinery companies uh, in the world uh, moved me to Cincinnati. So I uh, was really excited as a bachelor and coming to the United States. Uh, but uh, with uh, Millicron being one of the leaders in this industry, I had the privilege to work with many of the world's leading companies, helping them develop their plastic products. Okay. So I, I was, uh, uh, for example, involved in the conversion of uh, the first artificial kidneys from metal and glass into plastics. Wow. We downsized them from half a truck to basically a handheld device, glucose meters, syringes, petri dishes, in uh, all types of, of medical devices. Uh, but uh, the real privilege was I worked across all the verticals. Mm. So uh, I was responsible for the development of probably 20 plus generations of disposable uh, razors with all the leading so it's manufacturers. Like Gillette's and those. Uh, exactly. Okay. Uh, the, 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 all, all these companies, all the leaders uh, across the world. Uh, heavily involved in automotive, like I'm an expert witness with Mercedes Benz. Mm. on the taillight lenses of the S-Class, on components like uh, brake fluid container, brake assist, dashboards, bumpers, everything that's out of plastic. Uh, and I, I mentioned that also because one of the real key drivers for me was always sustainability. And when you hear plastic, you hear all the, mostly the, the fake news and the, the wrong news in, in uh, the news. So uh, well, t t sustainability was the key for me. Before you go there, Harmon, t take a moment. And I think for the audience's sake, it'd be really interesting to get your perspective. I mean, you're, you're like the doctor of plastic. So what transform like how, when you describe that time period? What was that? 10, 15 years? This of your was life? over 20, 25 years okay. almost. So he, by the way, he's only forty two. So you, no, <laughs> you guys do the math. Um, what, what were the transformations like 
through your eyes and through your lens during that time? I mean, when you're working with all these top companies around the world. What was the impetus for change, and how did you, how were you able to effectuate that with these with these companies? Because it sounded like they came to you with their problems, and you provided the solutions. Exactly. But what did that look like from when you started towards the end of that that tenure, just in the plastic space? Because mm-hmm. I think plastics are part of everyone's life. Yep. So I think for the audience's sake, they'd love to know, like, what is what does that mean, Herman? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, uh, the things you hear is carbon footprint and CO two emission. Okay. But the main purpose of why we design in plastic or why these big OEMs want to convert their products in, into plastic is lightweighting. Uh, my, a perfect example is, uh, I, I love it when you hear the, about the, the plastic straws or okay. uh, the plastic bag versus paper bags. Nobody realizes, or at least people realize, uh, there's a terminology, it's called life cycle assessment okay. and global warm, warming potential. So how much CO2 emission you have over your whole life, uh, lifetime. So when you have a straw out of plastic that weighs one sixth, so 16% of what a paper straw weighs, so how do you get the, the straw from point A to point P? You, you, you bring it there with a truck. So you need six times the amount of trucks to transport. Uh, and those trucks are not all Teslas yet. So, there <laughs> is, so uh, there's no electric vehicles in, involved. It. So uh, you have to, uh, on the one side, you want to save something. On the other side, you kill it, uh, uh, overkill it 20 times. The dichotomy, yeah. Yeah. So uh, light weighting is the, the number one objective. So uh, the, the cars becoming more fuel efficient. The, the new BMWs, the 7 Series, has uh, already 800 pounds of plastic in it. And they, they're even replacing the chassis now with carbon fiber reinforced thermoplastic. So really there are hardly going to be any metal left. I, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the, the metal obviously is still used for some structures, but, but when you see some of the, this was the cool thing about Millicron, they were in the defense industry also, so they, they made the tape layer machines for the B2 bomber. So the tape layer machines is carbon fiber soaked uh, uh, matrix yeah. that you wrap around the aluminum structure of uh, the frame of, of the wings, for example. Uh, really cool stuff. So you make it lighter. Uh, it uses less uh, fuel, uh, less abrasion of the tires on the road. So that there's so many advantages. Uh, uh, same thing with the, the water bottles. Mm-hmm. Uh, a PET water bottle weighs five, seven, eight gram versus a, a glass bottle, I think uh, 20 times the weight. Uh, the key is then obviously, uh, we have a term in, in plastics, design for manufacturability and assembly and sustainability. So okay. so you, you design it already with the end in mind. What's the end use or what is the, the end of the life use? How can you bring it back into the uh, recycling stream, into the whole life cycle? Uh, of uh, of the the product, right. you know, and uh, like uh, I did, for example, in my thesis already, golf tees from uh, non fossil fuel based uh, bioplastic cellulose acetate, it would decompose on a golf course. In uh, how how long roughly? Uh, it it depends, you know, when it's out there in nature, uh, it, it's probably a six months to a year. Uh, but uh, when you have it under composting conditions, it can disintegrate in uh, a month wow. easily. So you have to have moisture, you have to have oxygen. Yeah. They, they found carrots wrapped in newspaper from the 1950s in landfills because there was no oxygen and there was no moisture that would initiate the, the microbes to uh, basically uh, compost uh, the, the product. So uh, we are now working on compostable grocery bags from uh, made out of cornstarch, potato starch, and vegetable oil that decompose in a home composter in 20 days. Wow. So the number one objective of a plastics engineer should be to make it lighter and less expensive, right. you know, because you also think about function integration. So you, you don't make five different parts and then you have somebody manually put them together. You maybe do a function integration where you can plastic injection mold already two or three parts together. Like when you look at the toothbrush, perfect okay. example. 
the toothbrush comes out of a molding machine already with the grip in a, in a soft touch uh, thermoplastic rubber, the handle in a stiffer uh, nylon, and the bristles in another plastic and comes out completely finished. No more manual labor in, in Wolf. And you can move the labor, the manual labor, into more higher paid jobs, into the more engineering. Obviously, you have to do more training and, and all these. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, that's uh, that's basically the, the so, stream. So, uh, before we go down the sustainability line, I still want to go back just to kind of set the tone. So, what I'm hearing is, and I did a little research on you. You know, I was spying on you. And uh, for, by the way, audience, very smart guy. Um, so, uh, hopefully, you're entertained today because the one of the things I thought that was interesting was, and just listening to you, it was obvious that not only do you have a, a very strong scientific mind, but you were exposed to the what I call the business and manufacturing side. You were you know, Six Sigma, all yep. the all the lean stuff. Yep. To me, I heard, you know, and it was longer than your twenty five tenure. You combined both the, the the scientific intellectual side with what was pragmatic with the business side. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, a uh, uh, fair statement? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. A good example. Uh, first, uh, Six Sigma, I had really the privilege, I still get, get goosebumps, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago, to work on several projects with the inventor or the principal architect of Six Sigma, Dr. Michael Harry. Really? He was a, he was a resident here in Phoenix, uh, in North Scottsdale, uh, and he obviously developed Six Sigma, and I worked with him to create the digital curriculum of his uh, program. Wow. Uh, and so uh, just a fascinating person when you hear this, his stories. But coming to this, the results of Six Sigma, uh, typical example, like uh, one of my clients, they make uh, world leader in disposable syringes. They came, they threw a challenge at me, said, Herman, we want to do a 30 billion syringes with zero defects a year. Say I mean, that again, 30 billion. 30 billion with, with a B. Yep. Yes, zero defects, because you don't want to have a single child that has a syringe and, and hurts itself, something like this. So that would be the plunger, the, the cylinder, uh, the TPE gasket, and the needle, uh, everything together, and the packaging. That's a lot of math to get right. Yeah, yeah. And especially when you know that the average industry is in the three and a half to four sigma range in terms of defects per million opportunities, so which you, is pretty scary. So just curious, how... How, what was your approach then with that challenge? What did you guys do? Well, uh, very complex supply chain. There's the molding part where you manufacture the individual components, but they have to come together somewhere and have to be assembled. Okay. While I can double the output or quadruple the output on the machinery and with vision systems and augmented reality, now we are bringing in yeah. the, the, hot, the hot stuff. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later. Uh, there was the bottleneck on the assembly side because the assembly equipment wasn't able to handle it. So, so we had to delay that for a little bit and had to take, again, the holistic approach. How do I get 30 billion disposable syringes out of my factory and, and not manufacture the individual components right. in, in one plant and then move it somewhere else? So, so there's, it, the whole supply chain becomes more complex and complex, and especially now also when you work with companies all over the, the planet. So, so the, the front part of the design is done in Asia. Uh, some some of the design is done in Europe, and the, the final assembly part is done in the US, and so they, they work together. And then you have to bring the machinery together and make that work. I'm going to go tangent here for a minute before we go. I keep saying we're going to get to sustainability and all the fun stuff. But you just made me th really dig deep in my, in my thought, and I, I, I'm curious to hear your opinion on this. Do you think with all the offshoring and the global economy that that has actually created, created it, uh, the inverse impact of what you're just talking about is we have too much of it, so now it's really not Six Sigma anymore. It's it's anything but lean. It's it's a disaster. It, a total suicide, yeah. in, in my opinion, because for me, sustainability is also saving time. Ooh. The key. Layla, uh, write that one down. <laughs> sustainability is saving time. Remember that yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> and doing it in less time, uh, less expensive, uh, and lighter. Right. And uh, yeah, so uh, I was uh, for a long time the moderator of the top uh, plastics conference in the U.S. It's called Molding. Okay. Every year, top industry speakers. So I would bring industry speakers in, but I also would have one of the keynotes. And I always said, how to keep manufacturing in high labor cost countries? 
The worst thing we did in the late 80s, uh, 90s, we would outsource into China, mm -hmm. have it manufactured there. At the same time, we would send our top talent to China to teach them how to do it. In the meantime, this top talent was missing to teach our people here in the US. Mm. And all of a sudden, they went their own way. They, they made the molds in the next room on, and counterfeited and did their own thing. Not everybody, you know, right. I don't want to generalize it. But you see it in the predicament that we are right now, uh, the harbor capacities uh, are yeah. at, at their limit. Uh, all we need to do is have a little crisis and all of a sudden, yeah, we're running out of toilet paper, you know. So, so, so on that though, Airman, have, have you seen... Have you seen some of the better companies and more proactive companies realize what you're just stating and are they bringing it back in-house and being, getting back to more efficient, you know, end product, bringing supply chain right in-house and controlling all the facets? Or are they just still myopic saying, no, it's just too damn expensive? Or do they realize the upside potential? What no, are you seeing out uh, there? No, uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, I've, I've seen it. There's a lot of pockets of excellence. You know, it's not across all industries <laughs> and across <laughs> the board, but uh, a lot of uh, companies also realize it's not just my uh, monthly or quarterly profit thinking, but I want to invest in my employees. Yes. I want to train them. Like there's one program in Europe that has been successful Obviously, like example, Germany, it's driven by the ma and pa shops, medium-sized, small-sized businesses. So they would have apprentices, apprenticeship programs. So at 16 years old, you go there and start really sweeping the floor, but then they let you step by step to maybe to polish a, a piece of metal and then they put you on the uh, machining centers and then you have a certificate at 18 or 19. You almost had a job guarantee there as well and you knew what you were doing. But the problem now is, unfortunately, some of the kids, they have 20 jobs by the age of 25, you know. Yesterday they flipped burgers at the fast food restaurant. Now they're, they're standing coding. in front of a, <laughs> of a CNC machine, you know, yeah. with a million and a half dollar equipment. So, uh, and they realize that, you know, you want to have your employee retention, you want to have people stay in a company longer, what are the incentives? And so it, right. it's, it's kind of a renaissance, it's coming back and uh, in almost, I always say only a crisis brings a change. True. <laughs> And this is a positive uh, crisis that uh, uh, drives us, because we, we don't want to just sell life insurances to each yeah. other. That's <laughs> Although that might be lucrative too, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's get back to uh, the, the, the thing because um, for the sake of time, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. You, you're part of an industry that probably had, I mean, I thought we as con in the construction industry, we have negative connotations. You know, we're slow, we're, we're this, we're that. You know, we're slow to change, all those kind of things. But you're dealing with the plastics injury, industry, which gets a bad rap because all you do is look at the news and, like I said, every river is flooded in third world countries with plastics and things like that. So explain to the audience how the sustainability thing got you in to, um, well, not only that topic, but then how it got you into fashion. Because mm -hmm. then, then that just, uh, and the audience just hang tight because you'll see how this just parlays right into what we're going to talk about with the metaverse. So with that, Armin, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I was very intrigued in 2017 already by blockchain. Okay. And uh, what it could do, the distributed ledger technology, uh, the verification of ownership. Yes. Uh, things like that, anti-counterfeiting, uh, all th these things. Uh, and I wasn't sure how to apply that properly yet in the plastics industry. Uh, we, we had some approaches like NFT, NFCs, uh, near field contact. Oh. So you, you have an, an uh, iPhone, like a, a very expensive uh, cosmetic uh, container from one of the top brands here in the US. We put an RFID chip into the, uh, into the lid. So that's one thing. Or uh, we put an invisible ink on, on the label and with an iPhone uh, you could initiate an app and could already do the uh, check if it's counterfeit or not. So, so there, some of these things were in the early stages, but RFID, NFC, NFC uh, then also in terms of sustainability, how, how can you do training? We did augmented reality. We did uh, like the razors I was talking about. Yes. They were 100% designed on a computer before we made a single part. 
already in the, in the mid 90s. Okay. So that was in the mid 90s. In the mid 90s. Right. You know There comes a time when dreams become a reality. When you see your vision materialize into a true work of art. And the only way to get there is to choose a general contractor who shares that same vision and knows how to bring it to life. At Blue Wave, we aren't so big that we've forgotten where we've come from. And we aren't so small that we can't care for your projects regardless of their size. When your vision deserves safety, perfection, timeliness, and expertise in order to become a reality, trust Blue Wave to get it done right the first time. Uh, you uh, didn't have to waste any raw material. At that time, there was no 3D printing. We were talking about stereolithography, uh, SLS, SLA, fusion deposition models. So back then, could you still kind of get a 3D effect to it? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. With SLS, it, it's just laser sintering. Got it. Uh, it. So it's it's not as fast as it was with, it's now no. uh, with the 3D printers, but it's basically one step before the the really commercialized 3D printing that we are talking about now. So all these rapid prototyping things were available, but it took a little longer. You still cut the time to market down tremendously right. back then already. So fast forward, uh, an interesting story. My boss, uh, at one point I was in charge of marketing. I had a million dollar and a half, a million and a half dollar budget for one trade show. We would have 25, one trade show. 25 molding machines that we would send to Chicago. On the, on the shop floor. The boss said, no more, zero budget, zero machines to the show. Well, the good thing was, I said, fine with me, uh, because all our machines were designed, computer-aided design. So we had AutoCAD, we had PTC, uh, and we could simulate the machines, the solid models of the machines on a computer. So all we needed to do is, we made a fly-through program. So oh. we, we, we had a a black room just with curtains, completely dark, everything. People were sitting in there and you found yourself literally at the end of arm tooling in a molding machine and you could fly around. Or actually, we created that path. It was a pre-recorded video sequence in a computer-aided design. So this was... So before uh, Oculus or any of the VR yeah, type stuff. Yeah, yeah. Wow. We had some VR helmets. Uh, one of the robot suppliers, they, they were pretty far ahead. Also, the two and three axis robots, they had uh, VR helmets. Uh, oh. They were working together with a gaming company back then. That was fascinating. But now, fast forward now, I love fashion. Always like to dress up, uh, depending on the occasion, obviously. And uh, I work with many... Um, young fashion designers, mm. uh, helping them to basically apply Six Sigma in fashion. So uh, how can you l use less material? How can you create templates that you don't have the same uh, tedious, repetitive job, but uh, you do it all the time without any templates? So th things like that. And then I realized, my God, the, these kids, they do everything manually, everything by hand, the hand sketches. Finally... There is now, similar like AutoCAD, it's called Clo3D or Optitex, a computer program where you can create uh, a 3D t-shirt or a 3D dress. Uh, and you can pick the materials like uh, what we did uh, with tens of thousands of plastics materials that we choose for a particular item. Now you can choose silk, linen, wool for a t-shirt or cotton. Uh, and you can pick from a database, and the database grows and grows. And now, all of a sudden, you automate the whole fashion industry also. And uh, literally, they are 30, 40 years behind uh, in this part. And this is also one of the reasons why everything was shipped to low labor cost countries, right. where, where child labor is involved, where, where women's labor is involved. So now you can elim eliminate that. We have... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did a lecture here in, in town, and I met one gentleman, local manufacturer, bespoke manufacturing. They can, I think if I'm not uh, wrong here, they, they said they can do a wedding dress in five minutes now. Five minutes? Yes. And uh, when, when you look at the pictures, you see automated guided vehicles, AGVs, yeah. you know, induction wired uh, controlled. Uh, you see robotics. 
they take out all the repetitive jobs from the manual labor. Uh, with the 3D design, you literally, you can create the model, you eliminate creating a lot of inventory up front. You can look at the design from all different angles, put it on an avatar, and see how it looks on a body of dif different sizes, different shapes. And then you can simulate stretching and, and everything. So now you go into the mechanics of, of, right. of, of a t-shirt. So, so this was the bridge. And then uh, obviously right before the NFTs took off, actually they took off already with the uh, mainly uh, collectors' items and pictures, the the board a Art club. Right. But yeah. But our when we kicked off that project in uh, end in fall of 2021, we said no. This is not how we want to use NFTs. We want to have it to authenticate the design of a designer, to use the metaverse now uh, as the first test market for before you go into production even. Right. So, uh, so there's the sustainability now, and with this you can eliminate the whole fast fashion thing because now you can create uh, the samples much faster. I can literally transfer the tech pack and the 3D files to any manufacturing facility on the planet, and they can manufacture it there uh, around the clock uh, with the same quality level. So it doesn't deviate if it's an experienced worker or not experienced worker. So you also can narrow down uh, the tolerances on uh, your your products. What um, so in that transformation, what have you seen? And, and again, I'm uh, we're talking about the fashion industry, but um, I'm going to take a tangent for a minute here and just talk about how you know, in, in past episodes that we've had on the podcast or different guests talking about how we could create a good example to, to bring you up to speed, Herman, is the, you know, NFTs for think about if this is the plans for a building, right? Mm -hmm. yep. You know, every plan is its own NFT or every set is yep. an NFT because again, it gets plagiarized, it gets changed. Think about the digital transformation of it on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. It just, it's, it's like a duh, like we should all be there. Yep. Why we're not a hundred percent there is beyond me right now. But again, regulations, slow to change, industry paradigms, call it what you want. With that, though, speak to as fast as you guys were able to, you know, what you just described about how you can put it on an avatar, not waste those materials. Because think about that designer. If I can go back, I'll, I'll explain it a little differently because I watched one of his other videos is think about that struggling designer. Let's say she's got to go buy materials do the mock-up with an old pattern type thing yep. on a mannequin yep. or something, it doesn't work, right? Silk silk didn't work, but maybe a, a, a synthetic linen was better. You know, blah, I'm just making stuff up right now. So she would have been out that time, out that money, out all that, where now she can do it on the avatar and the digital, or even a digital twin, and that's, you know, even more than an avatar. And then that, that even the biofeedback you can get, all those kind of things, That's that's paramount her being able to make the decision and then if she's got investors or market segment all those kind of things is that a good analogy of exactly why what what is transformed in that space uh, absolutely uh, when you were mentioning that uh, investors or you know they have to go out of pocket right uh, and uh, it doesn't happen that a boutique buys right away <laughs> from you 100 t-shirts you know never you, <laughs> you have to put them in a consignment and then after six months uh, you may be a lucky, uh, right. they don't send uh, them back. The big retailers, uh, you know, they might have even 120 day uh, payment terms, but after 90 days, they can return it. Right. So uh, you have nothing gained over three or four month period of time. But now you create your virtual showroom. You don't need to go to Vegas for the trade show or, no. or to the buyer. You send them a link, like you do it on Spatial or Decentraland. Uh, you, you show them your showroom. The buyer browses through it, the line sheet, says, oh, I don't like that color. Okay, what color would you want? I've got 24,000 <laughs> colors right. to choose from. With a mouse click, they change the color of the T-shirt. Things like that without even making a single piece. Yeah, and let's keep going on this story because I'm eventually put the big elephant on the table here in a second as how it relates to construction is think about, you were talking about um, the local manufacturer mm -hmm. where uh, he or she, you said it was a he, right? Yep. So now 
let's go five years from now, he will only be his robots, his things, his back of house will only be producing anything that comes in on, a, on an instant demand, right? Mm, yep. So here we are. There's an avatar. Uh, I'm shopping. I, I'm looking online and I'm like, oh, cool. I really like that T-shirt. Mm-hmm. And I want it customized to me because I've been working out a few extra you know, yep. weeks and I have a different chest dimension than I did before, right? Yep. I can virtually try it on. I can see if I look cool with my digital twin. Boom, I hit order. It literally electronically will go over there and Amazon will drop it off in five days. Or, or something like that. <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm throwing you another elephant back here. Uh, uh, what we were thinking about uh, in the plastics industry already five, ten years ago, since everything is on computer-aided design, even the individual components, you buy a refrigerator. Okay. Have it installed in your house. Now one component of that refrigerator breaks. You have a 3D printer sitting right next to it. You download that file of that component, you get the material, you print yourself that component and build it in. Right. So no, you can th- do now the same thing with your, yeah. uh, with your T-shirt. Now, you're, now, thank you. Now you're going right where I wanted to go. So as you, I'm sh- sure you're still connected somewhat with your, with your cool background as how you were raised and got into plastics, is in the construction space, as you know, we're just littered with delays of materials, mm-hmm. right? And so the reason that why I want to always keep bringing up the metaverse and, and the NFTs and how we're doing this is, is because in that same scenario and the same analogy that we did with the T-shirt is that's where I think the, the, the leading edge people in the AEC space, they're realizing that with 3D printers and all these kind of things, we can do those parts now. We don't have to wait for China, okay? Mm-hmm. The technology is there. Mm-hmm. Um, the investment's there. It's just people getting over the crux of, is of the dollars, right? Mm-hmm. And when you really peel it back and you probably looked at the pro form of it, back to what you were saying is time. Okay, what is time worth? I don't think we equate what the worth of time is yep. as much as we, we, we say we do, but I don't think we really put pencil to it as much as we exactly. should. Exactly. And when I'm looking at, you know, you're talking about investors in, in the fashion space, I'm looking at the capital stack and investors in our space where it's tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. And at the, and the current interest rates, that's a lot of money. Okay, mm-hmm. think about what a week does on a $30 million loan. Yep. Okay, that's that's huge. And if we were to adapt and take more of the, the path that you guys are taking in the fashion industry, we could circumvent some some of those those hurdles. Yep. So, um, yeah, this is really exciting stuff, Airman. So uh, let's see. We'll talk about some other things here. Um, go back to um, we were talking before we, we, we got online about or on air about – some of the resources available here in Arizona mm-hmm. that you've been exposed to with blockchain and, and all the, the help that that's there. Um, I would advise everyone that I am going to have Jordan Rose from Rose Law Group on, I think, in like a month or so. Um, I had worked uh, with, with Rose Law Group because they – they did a, 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 a metaverse wedding here uh, late last year. For those of you that are in, uh, playing around in the metaverse space, um, I was doing some stuff with them, with Omar, uh, who's an associate under underneath Jordan over there, of looking at how to create different things within the construction space uh, with DAOs and, 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 and how to play in the metaverse legally. We we came up against some glass ceilings with the with the um, what do I say the government and regulations, mm-hmm. which I'm sure there's going to be more of that as we keep playing in the metaverse. However, you were talking about that th- there's the is it ASBARC or AZ AZ BARC okay, which stands for Arizona Blockchain Applied Applied Research Center Research Center. Can you explain to the audience yeah. how that works? Yeah. Uh, when we kicked off the project MetaX Fashion, uh, this is when all the big cryptocurrency companies out there were just throwing out money Left and, right. uh, yeah. uh, and uh, to, to the developers and to create new dApps, uh, decentralized applications. So we were literally, I think we applied and within two weeks we, we got approved. Uh, and uh, we did some research and we, we looked at different uh, colleges around the country that could do the programming for us, the back end. Okay. And we didn't have to look far. Actually, we, we picked three, the top three, and one of them was ASU. Oh. And they are part of, so we started the, con- uh, the conversation with the ASU Blockchain Lab and they diverted us to AC Bark, which is... Uh, Basically, the extended arm of the Arizona. Um, you say uh, the Commerce Authority. The Commerce Authority. Yes, yeah, thank okay. you. Uh, 
it turns out they are nurturing, uh, they are uh, subsidizing projects, blockchain projects here in the valley. So we, we had a discussion and uh, we realized that we put money in on a table and they matched our funds mm. to over a three year period of time. So uh, it was a no brainer that we, we went with this and uh, ASU Blockchain Lab provided uh, the students that did the programming on the back end. Nice. And uh, uh, AC Bark went through the uh, authorization process with the Commerce Authority. And within a month or two, we had the funds from them. Uh, interestingly enough, I think we were the fifth or, th or sixth member. Intel is part of that group, right. heavy hitter. Uh, Beckton Dickinson, medical devices. Um, I think Kudelsky, cybersecurity, and Dash uh, payment. Uh, Methods. Yeah, I would think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Herman, but the, I would think with, you know, we all know what what the Phoenix Valley is turning into for tech space. I would think that the the, the epicenter ecosystem around this is going to be pretty strong in the in the yeah. coming years. What, just for the audience's sake, to put, kind of put this in perspective, what were kind of the stipulations of working with them? Like, what what do they expect out of if you go into deals with with their support? What do they expect out of you in return? Yeah, there, there's a certain contractual uh, Imagine, agreement yeah. behind it. Uh, I think if we agree, if we don't want to pursue the project of it, it's completed. It becomes open source. Got it. So that's that's uh, probably as plain and simple as I, I, I can explain it here in, in, in that long contract. But uh, yeah, and uh, the other nice thing is we benefit from all the other companies that are in there, and none of them is in fashion. So, uh, and we have a very vivid networking uh, with these groups and some brainstorming and, and, and discuss uh, potential opportunities, especially the cybersecurity aspect of it is, is crucial. Uh, they do a lot of the auditing for the cyber, for the cryptocurrencies, mm. for example, Kudelski. So there was some uh, good synergies uh, that we didn't even realize we had with this uh, partnership. Yeah, when you said that, it just kind of makes me think of a lot of the you know, business forum groups that people join, you know, if you're a CEO, typically you'll get in, like you said, you'll get in with a group and you don't want everyone that's in your industry because you want to learn from yep. other industries. I think this is another very pragmatic approach at mm -hmm. that, uh, based on what you said. Um, but go back to, um, because again, sustainability is such a big part of the AEC space. You know, we're always getting dinged on waste and things like that. Um, talk about Talk about like growing up. I, I again, I watched one of your other videos, and I th I thought it hit home about. Uh, I think we as an American society could learn a little bit about with the past. Talk about how growing up the mentality was different about sustainability. I grew up with composting. My grandma had a compost pile, and all the food waste landed there. And uh, uh, I, I never forget the first time I reached into the compost <laughs> pile. You know, you first see, all, uh, you know, it, it's kind of. Uh, there, there's some moisture coming out, you know, it's a uh, little foggy and something, and what's happening in there, and then you realize it's, it's warm in there, so, so you understand all of a sudden how, how you lead the food back to the uh, origin, and you create compost, and you put it back into the soil, and then you grow again food. Uh, so you learn it right there. Uh, we, ha we have garbage bins. Uh, when you collect, uh, there's on the garbage trucks is a scale, and you get charged by the amount of trash you throw away. Uh, so by by the weight, not the volume. E exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So uh, you do. You're forced to do composting. You are forced to do recycling. The bottles, a perfect example, PD bottles. The recycling rate in Germany is ninety seven percent. Ninety seven. Yes, because what, you, you pay. And, what, and what's it here in the U.S. It dropped from 30 to 27. Oh, yeah, you said that earlier. Sorry. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but in, in Germany, you pay up front uh, 25 uh, euro cents extra, and then you have to return it. Uh, every grocery store has the collection system, the machine. You put the bottle in and you get the refund. So it's a one-to-one. Uh, -one. It's very, very yeah. simple. Yeah. yeah. And so it's a pre-tax, basically. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there are certain ways to do that. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we pay already a lot of these landfill fees. They are already hidden in our taxes. You yeah. know, no, nobody talks about that. But uh, you probably reduce your, your property tax or your, your uh, municipality taxes by uh, being more sustainable. There comes a time when dreams become a reality. 
when you see your vision materialize into a true work of art. And the only way to get there is to choose a general contractor who shares that same vision and knows how to bring it to life. At Blue Wave, we aren't so big that we've forgotten where we've come from. And we aren't so small that we can't care for your projects regardless of their size. When your vision deserves safety, perfection, timeliness, and expertise in order to become a reality, trust Blue Wave to get it done right the first time. Let's go back. Sorry, I'm going all over the map here. I'm going back to uh, when you got into uh, the metaverse with, within the fashion industry. Um, what? Because I want to draw some parallels, but I want to hear your story first. Where, where do you think it's all going to be five years from now? Like, and, and give me more of a a testimonial or a story that you could that the audience could relate to. Love, like you know, the suit that you have on or anything like that. Well, I, I think the, uh, this metaphor works very nicely also for the construction industry uh, because I can generalize it. One of the key problems that we're facing is greenwashing from a sustainability standpoint. So people make false or misleading statements about how green or how eco-friendly your products are. Right. Now with the blockchain, it allows us to certify the suppliers so it's not just an Excel spreadsheet that certifies that you provide me with green products. You have to go through a rigorous uh, test and certification process. And eventually, uh, is, you have the lead certification on, on the buildings, for example. Right. Now you go a step further. Uh, in, uh, like in fashion, you eliminate uh, sweatshops. Uh, the, the, the materials are not the the pigments are not lead based but uh, for example vegetable oil based uh, paint a color rent so eco friendly so you have to certify each individual component that goes into a building or in a suit and this all has to be blockchain verified and if you are not blockchain verified then you you cannot be part of that supply chain right so the again the analogy would be hey you know let's say on a project we have literally hundreds if not thousands of submittals mm -hmm. you know where this product's coming in architects engineers approve it they stamp it they go it goes back out i mean it's still old school this way it's just verified on the blockchain yeah done you know it's a you have a smart contract yeah, underneath it's, it's, it yeah and that smart contract does not trigger until all line items are fulfilled yeah it's pretty simple it's straightforward it's this is uh, was was genius yeah, you know uh, it's so, I don't know it's, so it's, so, it's so simple <laughs> it's stupid right <laughs> i i don't know if satoshi invented it or some somebody else some higher forces here, yeah but uh, no kidding um what um uh what what am i failing to ask you like what's what are you dying to tell the the the, the public about your experiences and how your own your own transformation is like what, what's your share points coming out of this i think we 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 kicked it off a little bit in the in the earlier discussion uh we are talking about blockchain because uh, we we love it yeah. we, we are in it we we want to explore it we want to see how far it goes but what what with the average joe uh how we need an adapter. We, we need people that adapt it and take it and go with it. I can create the, the most beautiful programs or the most beautiful dApps if nobody uses them. Our ecosystem, I think it's genius, but if nobody uses it and doesn't realize it, they first have to understand it. Uh, I mentioned uh, Venture Cafe, the, the lecture. There were probably about 150, 170 people in there, and they probably in, in the lectures that I've done so far, the most technical crowd. You know, I talk to fashion crowd. They don't necessarily need to be the technical but people. But this is a very technical crowd. Very technical crowd. So there was, uh, there were gamers in there, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, blockchain, everybody, uh, uh, faculties. So I said, which one of you has, at the beginning, before I started, right. so I could gauge a little bit my, my presentation, which one of you has uh, purchased an NFT or minted one? One person raised her arm. One person. And was it a mint or a buy? Uh, a buy. Oh, so a she buy. had. Any, so what? Yeah. You didn't even have a single minted. I, I, exactly. Wow. So. Uh, what, what about what about this? Do you ask this question? Uh, how many people have wallets too? I didn't even want to go there because. Oh. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> because it, it is it goes hand in hand. You, you know, if yeah. you have a wallet, uh, you want to experience. You you don't. You, maybe you don't even want to invest big time into crypto yet, but you at least you want to buy an NFT like a collector's item well, or, or, or something like that. And Herman, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think part of the pushback has been the negative connotation of crypto over the last. And you, you know, you've got the purists that are just salivating right now because they're like, "Oh, crypto's so low, they're buying tons of it again because they, they, they know and think it's going to rebound." And then you've got the other ones that, oh, that was a waste, you know, all these billions of dollars spent and, and gone down the toilet on crypto. But I don't think you, uh, the average Joe, back to the average Joe, understands that we're talking about mutually exclusive things here. It's like crypto is crypto, but the the blockchain technology is the beauty of this. Mm -hmm. You know, crypto yep. crypto is just a pro, just a product and a service that's on the blockchain. It that isn't that isn't not blockchain. And NFTs are different than than crypto. It you know, there there's a business and a personal application outside of crypto. That's what we're exploring. And I agree with you. It's like we we need more adapters. And we were uh, Herman and I were joking offline that I'm 51, he's 61, and we get it. And we're a bunch of old farts. And why, you know, well, some of these younger generations, I talk to them and they look at like me like I'm a crazy guy, which I am crazy, but I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted that it, there's not a, a greater, um, I guess, maturity and acceptance around the philosophy. I guess that if I can see it, why can't others? Well, uh, I agree to a certain point, but I also think it's a little bit our duty to educate them and train them and, and, and teach them. Perfect. How are we going to do that? Uh, programs. You know, there is plenty of uh, crypto experts out there that might go into academics. You know, mm. they might go uh, doing some programs. I not necessarily agree with. I heard one a council member talking last week when when they said, "Yeah, we need a six month certificate." It you cannot learn this in six no. months. There is absolutely no way. And if we want to become the Silicon Valley of the U.S. In, in, in crypto and blockchain, then we cannot do uh, these type of fast uh, programs. Uh, this is like my program was five years. Five years. Yes. And, years. and the average, uh, it's a little different, the school system there. The average finishes it in seven because wow. it, it's so brutal, you know, and there is no shortcut uh, to success. Uh, it, it's hard work. And uh, just by participation, you will not succeed in blockchain. And you, you were mentioning the the whole our the whole system is kind of migrating. Uh, a perfect example that blockchain in some form will succeed is uh, you probably heard the uh, interview with Larry Fink uh, from BlackRock. Yeah, uh, he believes a hundred percent in distributed ledger technology. Mm -hmm. So he didn't say in Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of the uh, cryptocurrency, but in, in the te underlying technology underneath right. it. And he knows that this is revolutionizing the, uh, the finance industry right. if, if, uh, sooner or later. So, uh, but this is where we start. We have to start on the basics and start not uh, what is an NFT. For me, an NFT is way more than a JPEG. Uh, that's my, my next speech at the uh, Phoenix Art Museum talking with fashion yeah. uh, people. So uh, it is really, uh, it, it will become part of our life. Good. But we have to lead them into this, uh, the young generation into that direction. And uh, uh, what, well, I think, well, let me spin this because, you know, as a parent, I watched my, my you know, I've got a 20 some year old son and, a, and a one that's still in high school. They talked to, you know, we're the gaming industry. Yeah. And, Again, you're much deeper into the weeds in this, Herman. So explain how the gaming has been both positive for this evolution, but maybe mm -hmm. there's some there's some barriers there as well. I'm curious <laughs> how you how you look at that. There's a, a funny story. Thank you for bringing up the gaming because, by, I think by 2025 there's going to be five billion gamers. Say that again. B five with a B. billion with a B. Yeah. Yes. Right now we have already close to six billion uh, internet users. So we are only one billion shy of all the internet users that are yeah. gamers. Yeah. That's it, 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 incredible. Yeah. So uh, when I have a couple of friends in, in the fashion industry and try to get their feedback. And uh, one of the, uh, a good lady friend of mine, she does a lot of the hair and makeup in, in New York Fashion Week. Okay. So I called her and I said, what, what do you think about NFTs? She said, what? What are you talking about? I have no idea. I said, uh, 
is your, do you have kids? I said, yes. She said, yes. I said, now uh, let me ask you, how many skins, how much money do they spend on skins, skins every month yeah. for their games? Oh, don't get me started. Don't get me started. So now she, she, she got the connection. It, yeah. Then I showed her the avatar because uh, the other issue that uh, you have with avatars is the real models, all of a sudden, they, they don't have a place anymore because the avatars look so, so real. I said, why don't you make your own avatar? Uh, so the uh, hair and makeup lady, uh, I showed her our avatars. And about 10 minutes later, I said, oh, my God, I know already five different things that I want to change for her look on the hair and makeup. Because also, you, you still need hair and makeup artists uh, also in the metaverse yes. uh, and, and things like that. So all of a sudden, she, she made the connection. And I had to basically build a bridge uh, from her kids that are playing the game spending uh, a lot of money on the skins. Well, there's a, there's a statistic, I think close to 10% of the current retail sales is only for content creation. Content. So the influencers out there, they are buying from Amazon or from Shane or from uh, Etsy of uh, buying the outfits, putting them on, leave the tags on, <laughs> in fact, taking their selfies, Selfie, yeah. and then return, uh, post it on Instagram and then return the outfits. And Layla, buying the next. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> She's over here scheming her next her next business model. <laughs> That's crazy stuff, isn't it? I think it's cool as hell. Yeah. yeah. So, but now with all the uh, with the body mapping, uh, with yeah. uh, with uh, digitization, now you can literally you go shopping and you create yes. your selfie on your computer screen. It's crazy. It's I don't know. I think it's just cool because it's just limitless creativity yep. and i'm sure that you know we'll, we'll find problems but i i'm I, I guess i just speak for one guy in our generation that uh, this doesn't scare me it excites me you know and that that i'm not i'm not averse to to embracing these things and seeing what they can do like i even contemplated of this is how and i'll put this out there and if anyone wants to steal it steal it i said what if i was going to be the first general contractor in arizona to build on the metaverse mm -hmm. and i just have a bunch of coders that are that's they're building and they're like, JJ, you don't get it. I'm like, no, they still need the expertise that I have. That exactly. The concrete has to go before the framing. And then the uh, you still have to build it in the metaverse like you do in real life. Yep. And I go, so all you students at ASU that are in the in the construction management program, come talk to me. Maybe we'll do that. Yep. <laughs> and even if somebody copies you, uh, you have a six to nine months or 12 exactly. months head start. And by the time they are there where you were, uh, you have done already some new stuff. Well, with, with four billion users, they'll, they'll be supply and demand. There'll be plenty. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you don't even need to go in some of those really complex areas. Uh, like, uh, I've, right now, we have kind of, we're in the midst of uh, trying to raise funds to go to the next level, to do the onboarding and uh, uh, creating also our supply chain tracing with the eco-certification. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a much more a bigger uh, bone to chew on. But I, I think that's a huge point in our space, yep. the supply chain tracing. Yep. That, for all of you that are out there listening, I know that you were geeking out on this because that changes our game big time, mm -hmm. big time. Because yep. that's half our bot battle. We don't know when we're getting it, where it's at, yep. all that kind of stuff. Yep. And, you know, going back to the automotive industry, in the 1990s already, they were talking about just in time. Yeah, it, it, It's just a different ter yeah. terminology. And and now you know how how fast they can build a car in hours. You know, they, they put it Seconds. together. Seconds. Yeah, <laughs> uh, literally, yeah. But I, the one thing I wanted to mention also in terms of uh, you can start really in baby steps how to apply Web3. Now I'm calling it Web3. Web yeah. uh, uh, you were familiar with Decentraland? Uh, yeah. Yes. So uh, I, I work with, with Spatial. I, I did a little bit with Decentraland. So uh, during COVID, a good friend of mine is a real uh, talented painter here in the Valley. Uh, we created a virtual art gallery for him. And... Uh, the other cool thing is now with uh, tokenization, NFTs, I can create the authentication of the certificate of origin or, or yeah. that he made it, but I also can do the tokenization or the token gating. So I, I can create a, a set of tokens and you only, almost like VIP access. Yeah. You cannot get into the gallery if you don't buy a certain amount or uh, you get 10% discount. Or, so, so you are creating How? this this immersive experience now uh, for for your fans, your followers, or for, for a small group of people of the same interest. 
just out of curiosity, Herman, how, how this friend of yours, yep. after he did that, it was he, right? Yep. After he did that, how did that transform now how, the way he does his business? Well, he, he, does he, this is, I'm taking mixed? away. Oh. You know, the thing is, it's the same thing like with the fashion designers. Mm -hmm. uh, we're providing the, uh, the programming services for the avatars as a, as a service. Oh, you are? Okay. Because I want to have the fashion designer stick with his or her core strength. Bingo. So, so they they are designing. They they do the creative stuff. Uh, we take care of the marketing, or we are taking care. Of, same with the painter. Keep painting. Keep creating. And in the meantime, we are looking. Who is our target group? We are talking to interior designers. We are talking to uh, some like retirement homes. Y you know where they use the V. Yeah. And, and on the computer, things like that, on the big screen. The same way now, you don't need to fly to New York to the uh, Metropolitan Museum uh, or something. You, you can watch some artwork uh, with the helmet on or yeah. even on your computer. So, so there's uh, some creative ways to, to, to do that. Um, we're almost out of time, so I just want to ask a few more questions, then we're, we'll do a, a spin-off session for Rapid Fire, which is a fun thing that we do. But... Um, before I get there, oh shoot, what was I going to ask you? Oh, you lost my train of thought. Um, oh, yes, I know. Herman, could you please? Because it's hard to capture in an hour podcast all the all of this, so I'd be remiss if I didn't try to uh, set up, uh, let the people know what else you're doing in the valley for speaking engagements. And, and like I said at the beginning of this podcast, people, just because Herman's playing in the in the fashion space don't don't kid yourself there's tons to learn here that you can apply in your own in your own industry whether it's aec or whatever with any of you that are subscribing or watching this podcast so with that you said you have some speaking engagements or guests coming up could yep. you just share what those are yeah like i i did one obviously with fabric they are really close to me the, in the fashion industry and let me interrupt that fabric one is out on youtube because i i did watch it yep. i believe it's like an hour and 18 minutes long very informative um it went re like it went really quick for me. So kudos to you mm -hmm. and, the, and the moderator. I believe it was a lady from Fabric. That yeah, it did was it with Sherry and, and Angela, Sherry Berry and Angela Johnson. And they, they really dug deep into, uh, so we were not talking so much uh, plastic or fashion, but how all the sustainability uh, is the basically the umbrella over everything. Right. And how you can apply that in all parts of, of your life and that accompanied me all, right. all my life. Yeah. Okay, so back to the original question. What yeah. else do you have coming up in this springtime uh, period? Uh, I think uh, I'll be part of the ASU collective, fashion collective. Uh, there's a virtual uh, event coming up in, on, I think, on the 19th of April. 19th of April. Okay, uh, I don't know. And to be honest, I don't know if we'll have, have released this by then. But. but 17th of May, I will be at the Arizona uh, Costume Institute and the Phoenix Art Museum. The Phoenix Art Museum, yes, okay. Yes, the, the, there's kind of a cocktail and lecture. Uh, Are there. you doing the lecture? Yes. Okay, yes, good. Yes. So, I think that's a very good date yeah, then yeah, to... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we have created some... Uh, if, if somebody is interested, we've also created some different metaverses. Like uh, I created a fashion metaverse that we did with uh, with Meteor Studio. They provided the VR helmets. Oh, wow. And uh, the guys from Venture Cafe. And I, I did the virtual runway shows, the digital twins. You were sitting in the audience, like an auditorium. Uh, we've created, uh, I've created an investor presentation. You, 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 you can, yeah. if, if you round up your investors, I can create the whole space for you to uh, have just this, again, with the tokenization, you have this exclusive access. Not If you don't have the link, if you haven't bought an NFT, you can't get in, for example, and, and listen to this. Like I'm an expert witness in plastics, so uh, I, I sell my plastics witness uh, services uh, on on the metaverse also. But again, <laughs> that's so awesome. <laughs> you you yeah, and you know it, it teaches people you know to use different like uh, they campaign in Bitcoin or in Ethereum, but they also campaign US dollars. Yeah. But uh, the retainer is obviously coming first, and <laughs> then they can get into the the movie theater. You know so. All right, final question. Is your avatar as sharply dressed as you are? You know, my <laughs> avatar, uh, you, you, if you see my avatar, bomber jacket, uh, really cool uh, slacks with, with bags on it, sneakers, oh. completely different, you know, and my hair much, much more than this one in all different directions. It's so, all, so. The alter ego by Herman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Herman, I can't thank you enough for being on today. 
um, it's, it's been just a real pleasure. So Thanks. I, I know fun. it was a little bit out of the paradigm of, of fashion and construction, but once I saw your background, I was like, hey, I got to get you on Mac and Blue because I think it just transcends all those verticals, like you said. I mean, look at here's a plastics engineer, sorry, a polymer engineer from Austria. <laughs> that's you know the fashionista. So look at if if he can do it, we all we all have applications outside our nor our norm. So thanks again for being on today. Well, thank you for yeah. having me. Thanks for watching, and uh, look forward to you on the next episode of Mac and Blue.